Are we ready for some more? Uh, thank you very much to everyone for coming back. I, I, was, I was hoping that we'd get sort of a really good crowd back and that too many of you hadn't just, like I think my dad has done, just gone the pub, which uh, I was tempted to do. I tried to ring him outside, but he was, I think he was about two pints deep, so he's, uh, he's, he's, he's happy. Um, we had a really, really good debate this morning with the, for the leadership hustings. It was very comradely, very friendly. It was, it was lively, so the, uh, the pressure's on, guys, to play nice. The 40-second rule, um, which we brought in in the earlier event, um, seemed, to do, seemed to work quite well. So initially, for the first questions, we want a 40-second answer, and I will be hurrying you along um, when that comes to a, to a close. Then, after a certain number of questions, we will move to a two-minute final summation, um, which, which will close the show. Um, so we've been going back through questions. We've tried to vary things up a little bit, because obviously this is a different role. Um, and tried to focus more on people who were very specific about deputy leadership questions. So, uh, these are the things I have been told I have to say that I didn't say last time. Sorry. Um, so, um, candidates drew lots about half an hour ago to decide which of them will stand at which podium. And the result means that Angela Rayner will go first, followed by Don Butler, Richard Bergen, Ian Murray, and Dr. Rosanna Allen Khan. Then we will move to a Second person first. This is a bit of really confused me last time. Two, three, four, five, one. And if you guys can just sort of keep on top of that, that'd be great, because I'm, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> numbers are not my thing, or just, or just basic logic is not my thing, apparently. Um, OK, so uh, each question will be asked to every candidate. When the candidates come out, we'll have no op opening statements. And no candidates will be permitted to interrupt, question, or heckle their opponents. But uh, a bit of light banter, I'm very much up for. So if, you, if, if people want to dive in and sort of say certain things, that's fine. Um, but just keep it nice and friendly. So shall we start? Um, for my first question is from Jennifer Corcoran in Southport. Oh, in front row. Front row, very brave. Oh, it's not a stand-up gig. But um, what key message from your campaign can I deliver on the doorstep to inspire our voters, old and new? So we've got 40 seconds, Angela. So it's about the key message from what you want to bring to the position that Jennifer here can, can deliver on the doorstep. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for your question. And I did visit Southport during the uh, general election campaign. And I think the key message for me is utilising every inch of our movement, our fantastic movement, energising it and bringing us together to sell what socialism is about, what the labour movement is about. And that's our greatest thing. And that's reaching our full potential as a movement and making sure that everyone can do that. And I think actually my role and my backstory talks about how we can unify the party to make sure that we get behind our leader and that we win the next general election because I can't think we can wait any much longer. <laughs> Excellent timekeeping there, Angela. Um, Dawn, same question to you. What key message from your campaign can, can be delivered on the doorstep to inspire voters, both old and new? Thank you. So when I knock on the doors, what I want people to say is, oh, yes, I know what Labour has delivered. Labour has delivered for us locally. Labour has delivered us whether it's a Metro Mayor or Police and Crime Commissioner. And Labour will deliver for us in government. Labour has made my life better, my family's life better, my children's life better, my grandchildren's lives better. I want people to understand that socialism is about aspiration. It's about making sure that you have a solid foundation in your life, that we build your life, we make you better, we're a part of you, and that nobody gets left behind. When I knock on the doors, that's what I want to hear them say to me. Thank you, Don. And the same question to you, Richard. Well, thanks Mary, very much, Jennifer, for that question. I'll be on the doorstep with you as a campaigning deputy leader. Uh, I want a people-powered campaign, so I want to strengthen our campaigning and messaging by focusing on 10 key policies in partnership with the members, in partnership with the trade unions to sell on the doorstep. I remember when I joined the Labour Party back in the mid-90s being very taken by the way John Prescott used the role of deputy leader as a campaigning role. I see it in the same way, not a leader in waiting, not a mischief uh, maker in waiting, but a team player working for all of you to get Labour back into government. 
Yeah. Ian, are you going to be a mischief in maker? Or well, cer certainly not, but I do want to speak to Jennifer about how she managed to get the Labour vote in Southport up 7% at the last election. Because my main message about standing for deputy leader is to go out into the country in the seats that we won, the seats that we lost, and the seats perhaps that we will never win, and listen to the public to let us reflect on what they're telling the Labour movement and what we have to do to get back into government. Because look, we have an 80 seat Conservative majority. That is a disaster. The only way we can transform the country and transform places like Southport is to listen to what the public are telling us, reflect on what they're telling us, change the party to when they get back into government so the people of Southport get the Labour government that they deserved. But the first stop is to listen to the seats that we won, particularly listen to the seats that we lost, and listen to people like Jennifer who managed to put the Labour vote up by 7% for Liz Savage in Southport. Thank you. Uh, Rosanna, what about your, your key message to the door? To the door thank you the door? very much, Jennifer, and thank you everyone for being here today. My key messages are of hope and unity. As the, as the daughter of a single mum who had to work three jobs to put food on the table, as a mixed-race child growing up in poverty under Thatcher and Major, I was written off. The Labour Party believed in me. I am the embodiment of what can happen when the Labour Party believes in you and allows you to fulfil your potential, and I now work as a doctor in our NHS. I want to knock on doors with all of you and say, the Labour Party believes in you. We believe in our future generations. Let's join together, let's rebuild from the grassroots, let's rebuild organisational capacity and take the fight back to the Tories and show our future generations that through hope and unity, we believe in them too. So this was a very popular question, uh, and I'm making no further remarks about it. It is, how would you support the leader, and how would you overcome any differences? Um, that's from Elaine O'Callaghan in the uh, Walton slash Warbreck area of Hello. this fine city <laughs> called Liverpool. Um, so, Dawn, we'll start with you on that one. Wonderful. Um, thank, thank you for that question, Leila. Um, so look, people talk about unity but I've walked the walk of unity, do you know what I mean? Like, it's great that everyone's talking now about being united, but I've walked that walk. I have served under two Labour Prime Ministers, and they don't come around that often, but we need to get us back there again, and we need a Labour government, and I've served in the Shadow Cabinet. And I will never, ever, ever join a coup, because nobody votes for a disunited party. It's a united party that wins elections. Let's talk about unity, let's show unity and be united. I've proven that I can do it and I will do it again. So vote for me as deputy leader. I will be united and take us to the finishing line and we will have another Labour Prime Minister. Richard, same question to you. How would you go about supporting the leader and what about if there were differences between the two of you? Well, whoever wins the leadership election, whether it's uh, Becky, who I'm supporting this campaign, whether it's Emily Keir, Lisa or Jess, I will be a team player, laser focused on working with and for them to deliver a Labour uh, government. We have to support our elected leader. Uh, I was under uh, great pressure to do the wrong thing, which was wrong for the party, when people were trying to get rid of our elected leader. I, of course, refused to go along with that, and I'm proud that I took the position. The Labour Party has always been a broad coalition of socialists like myself, social democrats and trade unions. It needs to remain like that. As Harold Wilson said, a bird needs two wings to fly and we can fly together, turn round this defeat and get back into government at the next election. Ian, how do you see that, that role? Well, the role of deputy leader is to support the leader of the party, but not just the leader of the party, the entire Labour movement. And I've, I've already pledged, as one of my five pledges, if I became deputy leader, to be the voice of the membership, the trade unions, the, the, the affiliates, the societies that are all part of the Labour family, and be their voice in the shadow cabinet and to the leader. I also think the deputy leader's role is quite simply to organise, 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 and get the party into a fit state in the country to be able to take those policies forward and take the views of not just the leader, but the entire Labour movement forward but I think there's one thing that is critical in all of that is to be a critical friend of the leader because in times gone by every single leader of the Labour Party that I've known has surrounded themselves with everyone that agrees with them and I think you need to be a critical friend in order to reflect that voice of the Labour movement and take that forward so we can have a really good strong leadership team. And uh, to you Rosanna um, in terms of difficult differences and also working together with the leader of course. how do you see it? The number one role of the deputy leader is to support the leader. 
I fundamentally believe that. And actually, I'm the only deputy leader candidate that hasn't nominated a leader because I will genuinely work with anyone. We've seen how the media and the Tories have fueled divisions within our own party, and we haven't been as united as we have been, could have been and should have been at leadership level. I've been proud to serve on Jeremy's front bench, but I also had to take some tough decisions on Brexit. And when I needed to do that, I picked up the phone. I'm honoured to call him a friend, and I said to him, this is what I've got to do. Will you support me on this? And it's always been respectful. It has to be respectful because the only way to go forward is to unite and we have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk at a leadership level. Everyone is sticking very nicely to the time frame, and I'm very pleased about that. Also, found my dad, he's over there, so that's good. <laughs> he's back from the pub. Um, I was really keen to make quite a few of the questions that we selected to be quite relevant to where we are here in... in, in... Sorry? Oh, my God, sorry. <laughs> I, I told you I couldn't remember the order thing. Sorry, Angela. OK, same question to you. Uh, apologies. How do, we, um, how, do we, how do we see the role in terms of working with the leader and potentially ironing out differences? OK, well, I think you can't be a leader in waiting. You have to be a support to the leader. And I made a conscious decision to stand for deputy leader because my strengths are in organising and supporting our leader. Jeremy will tell you that I've always been a friend who has not been shy at saying what needs to be said. But you'll also know that in my four years, I have never been anything but pluralist and supporting all of our party and our movement. That's why I've received so much support so far and so much nominations. And I absolutely absolutely thank everybody for your support but I promise you that I will be a campaigning deputy leader that will not do anything that takes us away from power and will make sure that we do get that Labour Prime Minister next general election. So as I say, we wanted to select some questions that were quite pertinent to where we are here in Liverpool and one of the main issues facing the city at the moment is that there is a a desperate need for a new hospital in the Royal Liverpool Hospital that is now going to be five years late following the collapse of Carillion. Um, we did a story recently saying it's the co overall costs have soared to 1.1 billion pounds now. Um, and the um, one question here, which is that saying that this person's biggest fear is the continued privatisation of the NHS. Can you give your view as to how we can stop this and also reverse it? So, we're starting with Richard on this one, please. Well, I think the kind of campaign that's going on in Liverpool in support of our NHS, in support uh, of that hospital, is exactly the kind of campaign rooted in our communities that, as Deputy Leader, I would support. I'm proud that the Labour Party has a commitment to public ownership. I think we need to further and deepen that. And when we analyse our devastating election defeat, we've got to make sure we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And that means no retreat on our commitment to public ownership, no retreat on defending our National Health Service from the depredations of Donald Trump uh, and uh, his counterpart uh, in this country, Boris Johnson. So I salute the campaign, and as Deputy Leader, I'll support campaigns like that in any way I can. Ian, how, how concerned are you about privatisation in the NHS? Well, huge, hugely concerned, and in actual fact, the creeping privatisation in the NHS has opened it up now to a trade deal with the US and uh, Donald Trump. The NHS is being created by this Labour movement, one of our proudest, if not the proudest, achievements. It was saved uh, from the Tories in the mid-90s, and it looks as though the Labour movement will have to save it again, and that's because the NHS is not just uh, important for the country, but it just epitomises our Labour values of being free at the point of use and being something that can be used by everyone regardless of anyone's ability to pay. The issue in Liverpool, of course, is huge, but we're only a few miles away from North Wales, and a Welsh Labour government, uh, Wales in power, Labour in power in Wales, showed you what can be done when you have Labour in power with our NHS. So let's get this hospital sorted, and let's also expose the lies of Boris Johnson's lies on the NHS. He's say, claiming there's more money when it's going to be legislated for to freeze it, and he's talking about building 40 new hospitals, which we know is a complete lie. Let's get this hospital sorted for the people of Merseyside. Thank you very much. And Dr. Rosano, I think you know a thing or two about, about the NHS. Well, um, firstly, I am so proud of the, of the uh, campaign here in Liverpool, but also thank you to any NHS worker or supporter that's here in the audience. Look, I still do shifts in the, in, in the a and &E. I put on my scrubs and I've worked under a Labour government and I've worked under a Tory government. As a doctor, I stand side by side with my colleagues and we can't give our patients the help that they so desperately need. I will stand up 
to this government as a doctor, as a proud Labour sister. It's the best thing we've given this country as a Labour government. But a Labour government also gave me the hope and opportunity to serve in our beloved NHS. It has to stop any, any form of privatisation must stop. It must be completely publicly owned. It is the thing that I am so incredibly proud of. And as deputy leader, and even if I'm not uh, elected, I'm going to stare the Tories in the eye every single day that I am elected representative and fight for our NHS. Angela, I've remembered you this time. Um, and what, about, what, are, what are your views on the privatisation situation? Well, it's an absolute scandal what's happened with the Liverpool Hospital. And actually, the Carillion collapse shows you what privatisation has done within our public services and in our NHS. I was a regional convener for over 200,000 public sector workers across Unison. I stood on the picket lines were against academisation of our schools. I did the North West Ambulance campaign to make sure that we kept it within our NHS. And I was there with Charlie within this general election campaign to say, leave our A&E departments alone. Alone, and I will continue to fight to reverse the um, privatisation of our key public services and to fight for what I believe socialism is about, and that's key public services delivered within the public sector. Same for you, Don. Thank you. Beyond no doubt, we are in the fight of our lives. My mum, like loads of people that came over from the Windrush generation, worked in the NHS. In 1945, Labour created the NHS. In 1997, we saved the NHS from complete collapse from the Tories. We are in that fight again. You deserve a new hospital, but trust me, Boris and his crew, they want to sell the NHS to Donald Trump. They are, at the moment, data harvesting all of our data to sell to Donald Trump. We need to stop it, but we need to fight together. Both here in Liverpool, we must unite. We must unite as a Labour family to fight to save our NHS and our services at every single point when they're trying to close an A&E, when they're not trying to build a hospital. We have to win a moral argument because we're not going to win the votes, and we have to fight together to save the NHS and to get you a new hospital. Well, while we're on the topic of public ownership and services and the North, it seems a very good time to ask about the trains. Um, Duncan Havant from Rochdale COP may well have come here on a, on a northern train or something similar, and therefore is asking about better train services, in, particularly in the North. He wants to know how you will achieve a crossrail for the North, which for so many people is seen as, as a really important way of connecting up the great towns and cities of the North. So um, we start with Ian on that one. Well, I nearly missed the hustings today because I came up from uh, London on Avanti trains and it terminated at Crewe. Uh, and trying to then get here was impossible. They said I was to get on a two-carriage uh, train to Chester and make my own way from there. There were 300 people trying to get on a two-carriage train uh, at Chester. Quite simply, the transport system is creaking under privatisation and we have to renationalise the rail network as quickly as possible. And alongside that, we have to make sure we make the argument to get money out of London in terms of transport spend and into the transport spend of the North East. Can you imagine a scenario of economic development in the North West, in the North East and in Scotland where I'm from, if all those regions were able to work together to put a transport infrastructure package in that increased economic development in those regions? It would be transformative. It would take the focus away from the South East and it would mean that people can work and the e economic growth in this region and other regions neighbouring it could be transformed. And that's what we have to do as a labour movement, look to the future in terms of transport delivery by regions in the North working together. Uh, we've done a lot of talk of, of HS2 in the national press, but up here we like to talk about HS3, Northern Powerhouse House Rail. Do you see that as a, a vital way of bringing back some northern votes as well? I wholeheartedly support the renationalisation of our railways. I think it is essential for, for passengers and for staff. And absolutely, it is an abomination that so many central government decisions that affect the people that live in the north of the country are taken in London. We absolutely have to listen to the people who use it. And if we're going to be serious about regional development and empowering people where they live, we need to listen to what they want. And even if we look at Northern Rail as an example, this Tory government have no real understanding and recognition of what is going on with the system. And they're looking at 
giving the franchise out to someone else without an understanding of the poor timetabling, the issue with the pace of trains. So I'm really proud to be working with the unions to support full renationalisation and making sure that in the north of the country we absolutely have the rail service that you all deserve. You probably know a thing or two about travelling in the north, do you, Angela? I do. There's a reason why we called uh, the minister at the time failing grailing in the north. Um, it, it, it's incredibly frustrating, and you see the money that's spent in London and the south and the connectivity. It's not just about rail, actually. It's also about buses, and it's about public transport and the connectivity between them. There's no reason why we have to put up with a fragmented, privatised, um, terrible system that we have now, which treats staff appallingly as well and doesn't value the people that work in the system. So I absolutely want it renationalised. I want a connectivity. I want the money spent so that our businesses and that our young people can get around the, uh, the north. And if you see what Greater Manchester's doing with our mayor around making sure that young people get free transport as well, actually, if we can get transport, free public transport, greener transport, then we can save the planet and allow our young people and allow everyone to get to work and to get our businesses moving as well across the north, which is incredibly important. Don, is it something you would push for? Yeah, so page 90 of the 1997 manifesto talked about how we re renationalise our railways. We must take with us all of our policies that will work for the country and talk about it from now until the next election because those policies made sense. Schnapp says um, that he's going to renationalise um, Aviva. The, the media didn't lose their shit, did they? Do you know what I mean? They didn't say, oh my God, this is some leftist policy that's never going to work. They're like, okay, we need to do that. You know, we have renationalized parts of the railway the government has, and it has worked, and it's worked so well. What do they do? They privatized it again. They, all they want to do is put money in the profits of shareholders instead of the public and making sure the service works for you. So what we have to do is change all of that. And we must look at our manifesto and know that we were doing the right thing. Our policies work. They are workable and they're sensible policies. Let's get into government so we can put our policies into action. That's the first swear word we've had today and I very much enjoyed Sorry. it. So, yeah. I promised I wouldn't swear. <laughs> Sorry. It was, it, was, it was a passionate moment. I think we all enjoyed it. Um, Richard, um, what about yourself? Well, I think Dennis Skinner was right when he said that the Tories talk of a northern powerhouse is a complete con. It's not the northern powerhouse. It's actually turned out to be the northern poorhouse. And we need investment in our communities. And of course, we need investment in transport. In Leeds, I'm on this pacer train that's been mentioned day in, day out, on one of these trains, which is basically an old London bus on wheels. We deserve better than that. I'm proud to be supported as Deputy Leader by Andy MacDonald, the Shadow Transport Secretary, who's done such a great job as an advocate for model, uh, modern public ownership. And we cannot, we cannot retreat on our policy uh, of a modern, uh, publicly owned uh, railway service. Uh, before I was um, a Labour MP, I was a trade union lawyer working for, uh, amongst others, uh, trade unions representing workers in the rail industry. It has failed, the privatisation has failed workers, has failed passengers, and now with the climate catastrophe That's on the horizon, there, it it's more important than ever that we get a modern, publicly owned railway service. So it sounds like you're all in favour of uh, public, public railway. Um, I just wanted to chip in slightly mischievously and ask if there's anything in the last 29 manifesto that you didn't agree with or that you think was, was not done correctly. Um, could, I, could we start with Rosanna? I'm really proud of our manifesto, and I think many of you in this room would be as well. A lot of hard work from a lot of colleagues, some of whom are standing here today, went into creating a manifesto that I really could feel I could stand behind. A lot of the issues that we had, though, we didn't have a media that were on our side, wouldn't let us get our positive messages across. We had to fight a defensive campaign, which meant that some of our, some of our messages were watered down. But we also weren't quite election ready. We didn't have long enough. So it felt that some of our messages weren't getting out in the way that they should have and didn't have the impact because too many were coming out in one go. 
but actually I wholeheartedly support the renationalisation of our rail services and I think it's all about accepting as well that we need to protect our environment. We need cleaner and greener services and we know that we can only do that by renationalising it. So I am really proud of our manifesto, there are incredible things in there, but come on, let's get a Labour government, let's prove to this country that they can trust us again, let's get back in there and get this manifesto deliverable and prove to people that we can govern. Um, Angela, when we asked this question at the early debate, quite a few of the candidates said that there was just too much in the manifesto. Is that something you would subscribe to? I think the difficulty that we had is we'd done a huge amount of work, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that I'd done with yourselves on the National Education Service, and I know that my colleagues like Rebecca on the Green Industrial Revolution and Andy McDonald on transport, we'd all put an incredible amount of work in, and we'd done all the detail, but the overarching message wasn't there. And I think that was the difference between us and the Tories. They had an overarching message, but had no detail. They were vacuous. There's nothing in it. Yet we put so much in. We had a Apprenticeships, we had rebuilding the economy, we had such inspiring things that I don't think was that radical. My generation had free education lifelong, we had public services, we had social housing before. I don't think that's radical, but we didn't have an overarching message that really pushed and pushed, uh, pushed, pushed that message across that line when we were facing such a hostile press and the difficulty around Brexit, and they just managed to pummel that down and we didn't we weren't able to combat that but I have nothing bad to say about what we were trying to achieve in our manifesto which to me was socialism Don were you were you happy with the manifesto listen I was over the moon with the manifesto but, um, and I launched a bit of the Race and Faith Manifesto here in Liverpool when we launched the Emancipation Educational Trust. And I launched it here, and thank you for everybody that came out and supported that. But let me explain something about the manifesto and a bit of the manifesto that got a lot of stick. Um, free broadband. Now, that sort of came out of the blue. We were like, oh, my God, free broadband, and everyone was talking about it. But when I talk, spoke to John McDonnell, John McDonnell was doing a tour around the country and he was touring around the north and he was talking to businesses and business said, you know, we're not competitive enough because we haven't got access to broadband. We need broadband to make our businesses work and grow. And that's where the free broadband pledge came in. So we, but we didn't have time to explain it, but it was really for the north to help the north build their business. So we didn't have time to explain it. And let me tell you something else. Bell in Loughborough said to me, the manifesto was a bit like a Toby Carvery. Do you know what I mean? Where you can get, you had loads of stuff on your plate and you're eating it, then all of a sudden I'm coming up and giving you some gravy. You're like, hang on a minute, I haven't finished. And then I'm coming up and saying, hang on, there's some Brussels sprouts. There's some Brussels sprouts in it. And they're like, oh my God, hang on, I haven't finished eating my potatoes and my carrots. And so it was just a bit much, that's all. So that's... <laughs> That's first, first swear word, first mention of Toby Carvery ever at a leadership <laughs> I like where this is going. Um, Richard, where, where, you obviously involved in the manifesto. What do you think about Dawn's point? Just a bit too much and a bit too much gravy on your plate, so to speak. Well, <laughs> as a vegetarian, I can't quite answer it directly. <laughs> But I, I back our progressive policies in both the 2017 and 2019 manifesto. I do think we need to learn the lessons of this devastating election defeat because our communities are suffering the consequences. Brexit overshadowed traditional party loyalties. And I also want to speak out against the demonisation of a decent man. There's no city in this country... <laughs> I'll claim another 10 seconds. 10 seconds, yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's no city in this country that knows as much as you do about how newspapers like the Right Wing Sun newspaper <laughs> demonise decent people. And that's why I was proud to take the Sun to court, be cross-examined by them. <laughs> be cross-examined by them for two days defeat them in court and use the compensation to set up a local internship for young people in Leeds. So just as right, they've Richard, demonised you there. in this city, they've also demonised Jeremy. The last point I'll make is that as Deputy Leader, 
I will set in place, working with the unions and with the members, working out the 10 best bread and butter policies to raise living standards, and from the day I'm elected deputy leader, we'll be out the length and the breadth of the country, connecting with communities, so by the time we get to the next election, we can win that next general election. Um, Ian, was there anything about the manifesto that, that, you, that didn't work for you or didn't work on the doorstep? Well, can, can I say what was great in the manifesto, the yeah. Green New Deal that's already been mentioned by Angela? I thought the prescription of the economy not working for the majority of people in this country was excellent. And I think the most majority of this country would agree that the economy doesn't work for all parts of this country. And that's something that we have to do. What I would say, though, when you, when you asked the question, I wrote down too many things in it. You said there was too many things in it. A lot of people have said there was too many things in it. And I think the next manifesto should have a relentless focus on the future, how we deal with climate climate change, automation, the world of work, how we deal with social care, fund our public services, and try and give a vision and a hope and aspiration of what this country should look like in 10, 20 or 30 years' time. And the one thing that wasn't in the manifesto, which came later, which I think was absolutely superb, was sorting out the injustice of waspy women. And the criticism the party got for that was not deserved, because it's an injustice that had to be sorted, and the Labour Party were going to sort it, and next time we get into government, we're going to have to sort it. Okay, am I in the right zone? Are we starting again now? Yes, we'll move on to Angela. And we'll, we'll uh, start with a question from James Gardner. We're going to have to talk about Brexit at some point. He's from West Lancashire, which I believe is a Brexit leave voting area. Um, he says, many Labour leavers feel left behind, both in the party and in the country. What is your strategy to win them back? Well, the next election won't be fought or won on Brexit, but what we do have to do now immediately is talk about what type of post-EU world we'll be living in, because what I worry about at the moment is Donald Trump, with the help of Boris Johnson, getting his hands on our NHS, the, uh, the lack of protections for our environment, the lack of protections for our employment rights and our consumer rights. We have got to relentlessly take it to the Tories for the next few years and then build upon what we want to see, and that's the anti-competition rules, making sure that they can keep, get their hands off our public services and that we can rebuild our economy and rebuild our industries here so that we can do the best by every single part of our country, including Scotland, including Wales and including areas like this that have been held down for far too long. That's, that's interesting, Don, isn't it? Obviously, Liverpool is quite a strongly remain voting area and has stayed with Labour. What about those leave areas? How do you win them back? So how we leave the, win, uh, the leave areas back is by listening is by going there, building locally the communities. I've got a campaign, organise, recruit and educate. We need to get back into the grassroots of communities all over the country and listen to what they have to say. Not judge, not talk over them, but listen to what they have to say. And from that we start building, from that we start winning and we start building trust. We need to start building trust again because Brexit is going to harm their lives. Brexit is going to harm people's lives if we don't get it right. We're going to have to take the fight to the Tories in Parliament, but we're not going to win the votes. The only thing we're going to win is a moral argument. So we need to get back to the roots, get back to the people that have left us, and make sure that that borrowed vote that they've given to Boris, we get it back next time, and we win next time. We win every single leave seat next time, and we don't give opportunity for hate to seep in either. Richard, I think I'm right in saying that you disagreed with the party's Brexit stance going into the election. Is that, is that correct? No, uh, I think we, it was correct to try and bring people together uh, on this subject, but it failed. I have um, experience of this, representing a constituency, Leeds East, that voted overwhelmingly to leave, and I've announced that if I'm deputy leader, I'll chair a special commission into how we win back the 50-plus seats that we lost in leave areas. In my constituency, which voted overwhelmingly to leave, our majority was reduced by a big margin, but we got a higher vote than we did in 2001, 2005 and 2010. I'm proud that my campaign is chaired by Laura Pidcock, who I believe did lose her seat in an overwhelming leave area because of leave. So I'm very mindful, but we've got to understand as well that we lost half our votes to people who voted Remain and half our votes to people who voted Leave. It's a distribution of those votes which caused the problem. So we can't leave anyone uh, behind. We need to bring people together and fight the battles of the future, not the battles of the past.
Thanks, Richard. <laughs> Ian, what about yourself on the, on the Leave voting areas? Well, as you can tell from my accent, I really know what constitutional politics can do to rip a country apart. And the big lesson for the Labour movement, whether we like that or not, is never to face both ways on the big constitutional issues of the day, because if you stand in the middle of the road, when it comes to the Constitution, you get hit by cars on both sides. And the issue of Brexit has been the totemic issue that the Labour movement have had to deal with. But we have to deal with where we are now. And where we are now is that the Boris Johnson government are going to try and take us out, probably with no deal come the end of this year, and we have to hold them to account uh, for that. But ultimately, and this is something we all have to do in Parliament and across our communities, is every single job lost, every single industry damaged, every single penny out of our public services, as a result of Boris Johnson's lies during the referendum, now lie firmly at his door. And we'll be holding him to account. And as Deputy Leader, one of the pledges that I've made is I will go around the country in a constitutional convention to find out how we govern every single nation and region of this United Kingdom, because the United Kingdom matters. It matters to the Labour movement. As an international party, we need to also be very close to the European Union. Thanks, Ian. Um, because I know obviously you were from a Remain voting area, weren't you? Yeah. How do you think you can reconnect with those Leave voters? I fundamentally accept, though I campaigned to remain and I was proud to vote against Boris Johnson's um, and uh, Theresa May's deal, I understand and respect that we are leaving. As the daughter of a Polish woman who has lived in this country for 45 years, who now experiences hate crime, I understand more than ever the importance of rebuilding our communities. As someone who works in the NHS alongside nursing staff and cleaners and porters from all over the EU who cry and say, we feel let down, we don't feel welcome anymore, we have to rebuild their trust as well. How we rebuild trust across the country with Leave and Remain voters is by listening. As Deputy Leader, I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to get on a train, hopefully, when we renationalise the rail services. I'm going to go into Scotland, into Wales, around our country, and I'm going to listen. I'm going to say thank you to our activists. I'm going to ask people how we get their vote back, the ones that they loaned to the Tories. And then I'm going to take this fight to Boris Johnson and his cronies in Parliament. And I am going to defend our workers' rights. I'm going to defend our environmental protections. And I'm going to defend our NHS. And I hope you're with me. So we are here in Liverpool today, and this again seems a very sort of pertinent question from Benjamin Sendall from Dellin. He wants to know if you, when you are the deputy leader, will continue to make sure that Labour is an anti-austerity party. I would just add a sort of extra question to that, which is Boris Johnson, when he's talking about reconnecting with the North, is talking a lot about infrastructure projects and, and uh, building bridges and things like that. And someone left one of our comments on our, on our Echo website saying that bridges won't look after your nan. So how much of that reconnecting and sort of funding local government is, is really important to you in terms of social care as well. Don? Is it me? Am I next? <clears throat> I was one of the very few MPs who voted against the welfare reform bill. And the reason why I did it <laughs> is because I wanted us to be an anti-austerity party. I didn't understand how we could be arguing as a Labour party for austerity, austerity light. It made no sense to me, and my principles wouldn't allow me to abstain. I had to vote against it. And so I will continue to do that. I will continue to ensure that we are an anti-austerity party. And Jeremy Corbyn was in that lobby with me. And let me tell you something, if it wasn't for Jeremy, we wouldn't have had the anti-austerity manifestos that we had, that we fought for in the general election. And we have to continue with that, we have to continue with our anti-austerity stance because it helps nobody. And let me tell you, Boris doesn't care about anybody but Boris. We need to care for each other. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Richard, how, how important will fighting austerity be to you if you are elected? When I, when I was first elected as a Member of Parliament uh, from a home seat in 2015, uh, and Ed Miliband stood down. I was one of 10 Labour MPs who wrote a letter to the paper saying whoever puts their name forward to be the next Labour leader after Ed Miliband must pursue a policy of anti-austerity. And that's why I nominated Jeremy Corbyn to be leader of the Labour Party in 2015. And that's why, 
I supported him in that campaign and in the second leadership campaign. I was also one of the 48 Labour MPs who voted against the Tory welfare bill, and we can't go back to the future. I remember when Labour wasn't an anti-austerity party. So, and I know that the members and the unions want it to remain an anti-austerity party. And as deputy leader, you have this promise from me if I'm elected deputy leader. In the shadow cabinet, and hopefully then in the cabinet, I'll be a voice for members and trade unions on the point of anti-austerity and all the other issues that are so important to you. Ian, in, in Liverpool, uh, the council have lost £430 million pounds since 2010. How would you go around addressing some of those the, the massive impact that's had on communities? Well, absolutely, and thank you for the question, Benjamin, from Dell and Dave Hansen, who was a Labour MP and one of the best Labour MPs for Dellen for nearly 28 years lost his seat at the election. We have to learn why and we have to learn those lessons pretty quickly so that we don't lose wonderful MPs like Dave Hansen again and we can get Dellen back into uh, Labour hands. Local government has been absolutely savaged by this Tory government because they know that local government is the basis for which this Labour movement actually works. You've got a tremendous mayor here in Stevie Rotherham in Merseyside, a very, very good friend of mine, although I disagree with him on his football team. But setting that aside, local government is the last defence now of our public services right across the country. The capital city that I represent in Edinburgh has had hundreds of millions of pounds stripped out of its budget as well and that's the services that look after education and social care and as you said Liam, look after our grannies rather than build uh, bridges. We have to fund and be confident in local government and that's why I think the Labour movement in the run up to the next election has to seriously consider how we govern all the nations and regions of this country and make sure that we have Steve Rotherham's up and down this country that's not only able to invest in your local public services but we're all able to fight for more money for them. Thank you, Ian. Rosanna, anti-austerity? I grew up with one heater in the house and my little brother and I had to move it around uh, from room to room in order to stay warm. There are 3,000 homeless children in Wandsworth tonight, which is my borough. I know what hunger tastes like, I know what it feels like to be cold. It doesn't know or understand regional variation. It matters. You have a commitment from me, an unequivocal one, that I will fight austerity with every fibre of my being. That is the reason I joined the Labour Party. That's the reason I work in, my, in, in our NHS. And it's the reason I'm standing to be deputy leader, because I am so proud that we are now the party of anti-austerity. And as your deputy leader, I'm going to take that forward. And I have been a local councillor. I know how hard it is on the ground. You have an incredible mayor here who is doing everything that he can for your communities. But at the end of the day, you guys are not getting the resources that you need. You don't have fiscal autonomy. You deserve better. Our country deserves better. Our children deserve better. Angelique, I'm sure you've seen the devastation that austerity has done to communities in your part of the world, and it's very similar over here. How, how high up on your agenda will be making sure that that money is put back into local government and the NHS? I feel like the whole of my working life I've been fighting austerity. I was in local government as a home care worker. I started my career as a home help, looking after the most vulnerable and elderly. And as a trade union rep in this area, I started off doing one or two redundancies and then ended up putting people in rooms like this of staff in councils and having to tell them after 20, 30 years service that they're going to lose their job. Let me say, austerity has killed and injured the most vulnerable people in this country, whilst they give tax breaks and support to those at the top. That is absolutely obscene. It what's put fire in my belly every single time I'm at the dispatch box or in our communities fighting for a socialist economy and a socialist world, because at the end of the day, Nobody should die in a trolley in this country and feel like that they were not good enough or somehow that they weren't worth spending a little bit more time and resources on them. That's socialism. That's what we do. That's what I'll continue to fight for. So this is on a sort of similar theme, but it's a bit more specific. Um, Councillor Kate Walsh from Hindburn COP says that currently child poverty is at 40%. I know, again, to give you local um, figures, it's in some places in Liverpool, it's one in two children growing up in poverty. If, a, if the, a Labour government was elected, she wants to know how you would make sure that poverty amongst the children doesn't rise and actually is brought down, what specific measures you would take. Um, Richard? 
Thanks very much, uh, Kate. And I want to pay tribute to all the work councillors do in such difficult circumstances. Child poverty is a stain on the conscience of our nation, one of the richest countries in the world. <coughs> the question is, how, as Deputy Leader, would I ensure that we combat child poverty? I don't think it's for the Deputy uh, Leader to be uh, a different uh, political poll from whoever the leader is. So I'll suffice to say this. I would ensure that we have a democratic party because I know that to all of you, fighting child poverty is one of your top priorities. If we have a democratic party where members and unions make policy and keep the PLP to that policy, then we can ensure that whatever happens in the future years, tackling child poverty and having a progressive socialist agenda never slips from our party's agenda. Terrible statistics about uh, the youngest people in the country. How, how do we address that? Well, those statistics should shame us all, actually, and they're heartbreaking statistics. And we see it at our advice sessions as politicians every single week. And Kate, as a councillor, will see it uh, as well. And again, you know, Hindburn's another seat that we lost at the election there. And Graham Jones was a great fighter for his uh, community. And we have to be winning these seats back. I would firstly. Um, if I was Deputy Leader, I'd be trying to make the case in the Shadow Cabinet and with the new leader of the Labour Party that we have a child poverty eradication bill. Uh, that's our first bill of a new Labour government, and that bill dictates every single thing that the Labour government then does to make sure we can eradicate poverty and child poverty uh, from this country. The previous Labour government took two million children out of poverty. We should celebrate that, but the one key thing that makes that possible is being in government, and I'm determined to make sure the next leader of the Labour Party walks through number 10 so we can say goodbye to child poverty for good in this country. <laughs> you must see some of the impacts of child poverty in, in your line of work as well. I do. I see, I see children coming into A&E malnourished. I see them coming in with breathing disorders as a result of living, living in substandard accommodation. I see them scared. I see a loss of hope, I see a rise in self-harming and mental health issues. And in fact, I'm proud to say that I wrote to Kate because I wrote to every single Labour councillor across the country that I could get an email address for as soon as I launched to say, I really want to hear from you, I want to work with you. As Deputy Leader, I will lead from the grassroots up, understanding that we have incredible activists, including councillors, at our grassroots. But I think it's important that we look at our manifesto and we take forward our socialist values and fight for jobs because if parents have opportunities, they can provide for their kids. No child should ever have to go through into school hungry like the kids in my area where I live. I'm going to fight for hope, I'm going to fight for opportunity, I'm going to fight for jobs, but more importantly, our kids' futures depend on it. We cannot take our eye off the ball, not for a second. And uh, there's, there's too many, you know, you know, from your role, there's too many children going to school hungry. What's the best way to immediately kind of deal with that? Well, immediately what we need to do is get a Labour government as quickly as possible, because I know what a Labour government did for me as one of those children that was waiting desperately to get to my free school meal. And that's why I was quite happy in my portfolio to ensure that we put VAT on private schools and made sure that every child in this uh, country would have had a free school meal. I think it's right, that's socialism in action. We've got to tackle the disgusting situation and we've got to highlight it. The Tories think it doesn't happen. They think we make it up when the kids are lying on the floor in A&E. They think we make it up when the teachers are telling us that kids are rummaging through bins to get their food. It's absolutely disgusting. We've got to hold uh, the Tories to account on that issue and then we've got to make sure that we get that Labour government going forward and it started for me in the early years. We have got to make sure that we get that sure start plus all of those things that we were advocating in our manifesto and working class people do not want handouts. They want the means to be able to get a decent wage and look after their own family and their own kids and we've got to make sure that we do that. Don, how, how do we get child poverty coming down? Well, I was the Minister for Young Citizens and Youth Engagement, and I was in government when we poured out two million 
children out of poverty. And the Tories and opposition said we would never do it, and we did. And when the Tories got into government, you know what they did? They changed the goalposts. They changed how they measured it. So now we don't even know, really, how many children are actually in poverty, because they've changed how it gets measured. That's what they do. They try and trick people. And we need to say uh, we're not going, I nearly swore, we need to say that we are not going to, we're not going to accept that. And we have to push policies like Sharon Hodgson, who's chair of my campaign, breakfast club, making sure that we have a breakfast club in school. Sometimes that's the only meals that children get. And also school uniforms. You know, they're just too expensive. And, you know, and so we have to make sure that policies like that, we start pushing the government. Because we can start winning the moral argument, even though we may not be able to win the votes because they're a stupid eating majority. <laughs> So there was, um, as you can probably imagine, quite a lot of questions on the issue of anti-Semitism within the party. And myself and the other moderators thought it would be best place to just ask quite simply how you think the role of deputy leader can help to tackle that issue and what you would want to do. Um, so Ian, I think we're starting with you. Yes, I think the anti-Semitism issue in our party uh, and the cancer that has grown up in our party is something that we should be eradicating as quickly as possible. And I can quite simply say, as another pledge that I've made if I become deputy leader of this party, that I want every single case of anti-Semitism on my desk every week and I want to make sure they're being dealt with in a zero-tolerance approach. Not just because we have to deal with it and get anti-Semitism out of our party, but we have to reconnect with the communities that felt fearful of a Labour government and fearful for voting for a Labour government. I think that's something we should all reflect on incredibly seriously indeed. So as Deputy Leader of this party, I'll take personal responsibility for all compliance and all complaints to make sure things are dealt with so we never go into an election again when you knock on a door and someone answers it and says, I am Jewish, I cannot vote Labour. That's a disgrace and something that I'm determined to sort. Uh, Rosanna, what about yourself? If I am elected as Deputy Leader of the Labour Party, my first major meeting will be with reps from our Jewish community to start the vital task of trying to rebuild the huge amount of damage that needs to be repaired that we've caused with the community. I'm proud to have signed the Board of Deputies 10 pledges and I'm actively engaging with JLM. I will separate the complaints process from headquarters and make it independent and I would immediately get the independent team to review all cases acting swiftly and expelling people who have been anti-Semitic. I'll put a time limit on when cases need to be resolved by and I will commit to adopting every recommendation proposed by the EHRC. There is no room for racism in our party and I would hope that every single leader and deputy leader candidate will apologise to the Jewish community for the fact that they no longer feel that they belong in our movement. Angela, how do you see your role if you were deputy leader in dealing with this issue? Well, we need action and not just words. And I'm proud this week, actually, one of the legacies that I was involved in from Unison is a group of our activists take people over to Auschwitz from Liverpool and our young people to show where anti-Semitism and racism can lead to and making sure that education is there. I make no apologies for being proud that we've always been an organisation, a movement that has been proud of our anti-racist and anti-Semitism work that we've done. But we have to recognise, we have to recognise that our party's grown substantially and there has been anti-Semites in this party and we've got to kick them out immediately. And I see my role as making sure that our systems internally, not just externally, we can't outsource this problem, internally our systems are robust enough so we can be proud again of our roots as a party that stands up against any form of racism, anti-Semitism or fascism in this country. The, Don, Labour Party, Sorry. the Labour Party and the socialist movement has a proud record of standing up against bigotry and racism. I hate racism. I suffer it every single day. And me saying that I'm going to be deputy leader, I've had more racism than I've had before. So I hate racism and it has to be eradicated. The majority of people in the Labour Party are not racist, are not anti-Semitic, but we do have a few. 
and they do have to be booted out of the party. And what I want is a structure and system that works for everyone. I want to have the debate and the discussion about racism. I can have that debate about racism as a black woman that suffers it every single day. And I want to have it. And I don't want anyone to be scared about having a debate about racism because we have to eradicate it. And I want a system that works for whether you are racist, whether you are homophobic, whether you are transphobic, whether you are misogynistic. I want a system that means that everybody either learns or gets booted out of the party because there's no place for racism or racists in our party. And we have to make sure that we keep that out. But the thing is this, the EHRC are investigating us at the moment. It's nothing to be proud of. And I don't want to jump the gun on whatever they're going to come out with. So I haven't signed the 10 pledges because I want the EHRC report to be implemented in the party. And then we sit down with the board of deputies, JLM, the other Jewish groups, and we have a discussion about where we go next. I don't want to rush this. It's too important to rush, and we have to get it right. Thank you, Don. We've got to eradicate racism, and we have to get it right. And I don't want to rush this. I want it to be right. Richard, what about yourself on this issue? There's no place for anti-Semitism or anti-Semites in our party. I'll never forget when I was at school meeting a survivor from Auschwitz who rolled up his sleeve and showed myself and my classmates the tattoo on his arm which had the serial number from Auschwitz. That shows where hatred, where racism and where anti-Semitism uh, leaves. I will support the leader in fighting anti-Semitism in our party and fighting anti-Semitism in society. Uh, I do believe, obviously, in working with the Board of Deputies in the fight against anti-Semitism. I have not signed and won't be signing the 10 pledges, however, <laughs> because, because of some concerns I have. Firstly, I'm concerned about outsourcing our complaints procedure and how that would work in practice. So I think that needs clarifying. Uh, but secondly, I want to work with the Board of Deputies and all Jewish organisations against discrimination. OK, thank you, Richard. Can, can I... Uh, it's a quickly, serious yeah. point. Can yeah, I, go on. It's a, it's a very serious point that I think we do need to uh, address in detail. Because I'm concerned that the minorities within a minority, whether it be LGBT, uh, Jewish people, black Jewish people, uh, Jewish people who are a religious minority within that religious minority, their voices need to be heard as well. We need to listen and act with the whole uh, Jewish community. And finally, finally, I would say this, in relation to the IHR uh, A uh, definition, uh, the party added in a clear statement that it wouldn't undermine freedom of expression on Israel or on the rights of Palestinians. So I do want, if I become deputy leader, discussions with the Board of Deputies uh, to clarify all of those points. But of course, whoever is leader will make their decision. Um, OK, a, a, another issue here. This is from Richard Jack in St Helens, North CLP. And a few of you have talked about Steve Rotherham's role here, regional devolution. Um, he wants to know if you would support electoral reform, constitutional reform, and more regional devolution. Um, am I right that we start with Rosanna? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting it. Thanks. I'm finally getting it. Um, yeah, so electoral reform principally, and then more regional devolution. Are you for it? Um, yes, I am for more regional devolution, definitely. Um, I can really see the benefits of what it's done here in Liverpool and also in Manchester. I do think there is a discussion to be had about electoral reform, but I don't think we can rush this. There was a referendum on an um, alternative voting system um, done almost a decade ago, which had a really low turnout and overwhelmingly people voted against it. I do think we need to look at where we need to work with other parties to affect the aims that we need to do going forward for our communities. But me personally, I'm not a career politician. I have no plans to be a politician. And then when the chance came to represent my community where I'm born and raised, I threw my hat in the ring because I wanted to represent my community. And I would want to make sure that if there was any form of um, electoral reform that it took into account people who want to represent their community, and I'd want to make sure that that certainly didn't leave the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people don't feel particularly represented by the first-past-the-post system. How do you feel about proportional representation or something like that? 
Well, I think, first of all, my priority is around making sure that devolution and that Scotland and Wales don't feel like annexed to England and that people in England don't feel like they're pitched north, south, east and west as well. And I think the devolution and people having more control and feeling like they've got more control and power within their areas is a really positive thing. And at the moment, it feels like it's been grudgingly given rather than actually working in collaboration with our areas. And when we do get devolution, when we do get that power back, at source. We see that people feel much more engaged in their politics. I think votes at 16 I mean, is incredibly important that our young people are engaged. They should get the votes at 16. And I also think political education is crucially overdue in this country. And that our current curriculum teaches kids about colonialism and the empire and teaches them nothing about our democracy here today. And that's what we need to be doing. Don, what about yourself? More, more power to the regions? More, more power to the people, absolutely, every <laughs> single time. Power to the people. Um, so jo Johnson is going to try and suppress the vote, right? We know that. Voter ID, do you know what I mean? He's not going to reduce the voting age. It's all about suppressing the vote. So we do need to talk about electoral reform. We need to have a discussion about it. We need to have a discussion how we move forward. The majority of people voted for left parties, but that wasn't reflected in Parliament. So now that debate is long overdue. They are going to put forward boundary changes. Boundary changes means that we're going to lose at least 30 seats. That means that we could maybe never, ever get into power again if we allow them to get away with it. So we have to have the debate. And that's why, as your deputy leader, I will travel around the country with my core strategy, campaign, organise, recruit and educate. Kate, and I'll make sure that this forms part of the discussion about what we do and how we do it. Thanks, Don. <laughs> Richard, do you think we need a, a new voting system in this country? I think we need to carry on with the work of the Constitutional Convention and we need to defend uh, our uh, democracy because voter ID and the rigged boundary changes are both straight from the Republican playbook trying to disenfranchise voters. Uh, I also think that people won't take us seriously in relation to democratising uh, our society if we don't democratise further our party. I think <laughs> we can't have it where members and trade unionists are basically the unpaid posties of the Labour movement, pushing leaflets through the doors without having a strong enough say on what policies are on those leaflets. And secondly, I also support open selection so that members... <laughs> so that members and trade unions can have a full and democratic say and make the decision about who is their parliamentary candidate in each and every general election. Ian, I guess you know a thing or two about devolution as well. Well, I've uh, been there, done that, worn the T-shirt, burnt the T-shirt, doused the T-shirt in water, put it back on again. I mean, the constitutional arguments of the United Kingdom... Is that your daily routine, is it? That's my daily yeah, routine, yeah. It's well, <laughs> slightly larger T-shirt these days, perhaps. <laughs> but the constitution of the UK is incredibly important. And it's boring. Governance is boring. We all don't... We don't, didn't join the Labour movement to talk about governance, but it's actually critical to the future of the United Kingdom in a post-Brexit Britain. I want to make sure we can have a conversation around the country where we give power directly to our communities. Yes, you're right about councillors being our unpaid posties for the party. The councillors need the power and the money and the accountability and the responsibility because they know their communities best. So I've made a clear commitment as Deputy Leader of the Labour Party. I will take personal responsibility for making sure that we, don't, we stop talking about what we do with the Constitution and we go around the country and build a proper constitutional convention about how we govern in the future. Because our nations of the UK, and more importantly, the regions of the UK, are incredibly important to this party. And if we believe that the United Kingdom should stay together, we need to get more power out of London and out of Westminster and into the hands of the people who know best, and that's in local communities. So subsidiarity would be right at the top of that list. I think it's the job of the Deputy Leader not just to see how we organise our party, but I think it's about time now that we reorganised our country and how we govern it. And just a little bit on PR. I'm a big fan of proportional representation. We have votes for 16 and 17-year-olds in Scotland. We have a different voting system for local government. We certainly have a different voting system for the Scottish Parliament. But the one caution I would give is we need to find a system that doesn't throw out the geographical link between your elected member and the public. Because if we do that and break that link, I think politics becomes even more divorced from the public.
Um, can I just add one question myself? We talk about constitutional reform, and we've heard Rebecca Long Bailey talking about removing the House of Lords, and we heard in the Labour manifesto, well, John McDonnell talked about the idea of moving a key part of the Treasury up to the north. Um, Angela, would you consider moving any parts of government to outside of London? Absolutely, and my campaign headquarters is in Arena Point in Manchester, so um, I think it's really important that we are able to move away from London and to show that we have a presence across, whether that's in Scotland and the work there, whether that's in Wales with our Welsh government, or whether that's in all of our regions in all areas. And I think our coastal and rural areas have always felt that they've not been given the support that they need. And some of our um, key areas that feel left behind, actually, we can inject that positivity by having a presence there and making sure that we're much more broader on that. And then a lot of my talent in Ashton Underline doesn't have to move to London. They can stay in Ashton Underline and deliver for my local economy and inspire people to stay local. Don, would you, would you consider breaking up the government at all, moving more powers to different parts of the country? I think, I think yes, we'd have to look at that. But I also think now, and I said this in Shadow Cabinet, can we start having our shadow cabinet meetings around the country so that we can go around the country, spend time there so you can get to meet us so we can have discussions with you at a shadow cabinet. Let's start as we mean to go on so that when we're in government, it won't seem so alien to us to be having things done outside of London. So that was something that I have requested and Jeremy Corbyn said that it will be done. So watch this space. Richard, would you like a shadow cabinet meetings in Leeds? Yeah, that'd be great, uh, on a number of uh, levels. I'd make myself really unpopular if I say my dream for the location of Parliament itself would be halfway between Leeds and Bradford. Because I love, <laughs> I, love, I love going down to see uh, Dawn uh, and Rosanna, and I think they should have the pleasure of travelling on our nationalised, publicly owned railways <laughs> under a Labour government up to halfway between Leeds and Bradford, because even when the Romans were in charge. Uh, York, of course, in the centre of the UK was the capital. So I'm not proposing that London isn't the capital, of course, but on a serious note, I do think it's important that we listen to experiences from all parts of the United Kingdom and from all communities and represent the working class in all its diversity, and that means geographically as well. You could, you could have a Toby Carvery after Shadow Cabinet. <laughs> <but, laughs> yeah. Or um, <laughs> Ian, do you think that we need to sort of bring more power to places like Merseyside? Obviously, we've started to get some of the powers of devolution, but perhaps not all the funding and, and, and other powers that we need. Uh, absolutely. It's not just about devolving the accountability. It's about devolving the power to do things uh, with that accountability. And Merseyside and our Greater Manchester and Scotland and Wales show you that actually proper devolution works. Sadiq can uh, in London. And anybody who thinks that Parliament couldn't be moved out of London should uh, try and land at London City Airport in a gale force wind, and you'd be absolutely convinced that we should move it uh, to the north so we don't have to fly uh, into those airports and use the dreadful train system uh, that we've got. But it's not... I don't want this debate to be about moving government departments. I don't want it to be about moving the Treasury to Liverpool or moving the DWP to Newcastle. It's got to be about actually moving the power so you don't need those departments in London at all. And that's what a constitutional convention should seriously look at, is where is it best to deliver power for the people of this country? Because you know, Liverpool's as far away from Westminster as the west of Wales is from Cardiff, as in Inverness is from Edinburgh. Send governments store power where Parliament is. So let's get the powers out rather than talking about where actually the brass plate goes. Was that it yourself? Oh, well, I'd just like to reassure Richard that I spend more than my fair share of time on the trains. I support a certain local football club. I'm a lifelong supporter. And also my husband is from a Welsh mining village in the valleys of Wales. So we've had our fair share of cups of tea waiting on delayed trains. <laughs> Wholeheartedly, I'd welcome any opportunity to travel around the country and have meetings and have departments moved. But I also believe that fundamentally the power has to go back to the people. Nobody knows your communities like you do. You should have a say. And as your deputy leader, I've already said I'm going to roll up my sleeves, I'm going to come here more times than you care to see me, and I'm going to ask you what matters to you, and I'm going to take those messages back to Westminster where it is now, but I do hope we do move around the country. Just one more thing, though, on the Houses of Parliament themselves. Has anyone noticed that Zach, Zach Dogwhistle Goldsmith has just moved from one chamber to the other? 
We need to have a serious look at how this works and really think about what happens with the House of Lords going forward. Are you, uh, are you purposely not revealing what the local football team is, or are you going to tell us? I support Liverpool. I've been a lifelong supporter of Liverpool. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm going to own it. And, and in the words of Mo Salah, being Scouse is a state of mind. So consider me Scouse. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just keeping well out of that one. Um, so, uh, we, we come to our closing statements now, guys. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Thank you, everyone, for submitting them. So, we'll start from the original order, which is Angela. Um, we've got two minutes now. I know, exciting. Look at the clock. It's changed. Um, you're not going to know what to do with all that time, are you? Two minutes um, on why you should be the deputy leader of the Labour Party. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sticking around this afternoon and listening to the debate. Um, I think deputy leader is just as important as who we choose for our leader because they will be working with the leader to transform and make sure that we continue on the path that we started when Jeremy Corbyn was elected. And you should be very proud of what we've achieved as a movement. You should be very proud of what we do. And I'm delighted that the first uh, hustings that we've had has been within the historic city of Liverpool, where the working class movement was pretty much formed, trade unions and our labour values oozes in everything that we do here. And I'm standing to be the next deputy leader of the Labour Party because I want our socialism that's rooted in real people's lives. A socialism that understands the needs of the country and offers solutions so that those that desperately need it get that support. If you elect me, I will work to bring our party together again so that as a movement we can hold the Tories to account and challenge the Tories' cuts, the privatisation and attacks on our communities. As a trade union organiser, most of my life, I know this won't be done through a top-up, down structures, but a collective socialism to achieve positive changes that we all need. But that change has to come first and foremost from within. Because it won't, we don't need a rethink and renew for purpose. We need to reverse the long-term trends that have led us to losing four consecutive general elections and convince people to join us on that journey or we risk becoming irrelevant. I don't ever want to feel like I did on December the 12th ever again. We have to face up to the harsh lessons that we had on that elected uh, election defeat. But that's what we'll do together as a collective organisation. And as a union rep, I worked for positive change, challenging injustice. It's the same fundamental purpose that I've had as a Labour MP. We, I'll fight every step of the way to ensure that we continue the path that we've started together. So if you elect me, you'll elect us to win. Don, what about yourself? Why should we elect you as Deputy Leader? Thank you. And thank you, Liverpool. Thank you for making me an honorary Scouse bird yesterday. <laughs> I, I will carry this around with me for pride, with pride. Thank you so much. I am a working class trade unionist. I started work on a market stall selling bras and knickers, just in case you're interested. Um, I, have a, I have a record of winning, a record of winning for others, but also a record of winning for the Labour Party. And what I want to do is make sure we lay foundations to make sure that everybody has a chance to win. And that means taking on things like the judicial system, putting in place the Hillsborough law, which means that everybody will have fair access to representation. I want to make sure we do things like that. I mean, I won the seat to Labour with a 28.4% swing, the biggest in the country. When it comes to unity, people may talk it, but I have walked it. And let me tell you, it ain't always easy, but if you are committed to a Labour government and getting Labour in power, you will do it. I am the first black woman to have spoken from the dispatch box. I've served under two Labour prime ministers, and I served in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet. I never have, and I never will be part of a coup, because divided parties do not win elections. And I have been in government 
Let me help us get us back there again in five years' time. We can do it. We can get back into government. This is a grassroots campaign. My campaign is a grassroots campaign. Thank you to everybody that came out. Dawn for deputy, get Dawn on the ballot. Thank you so much. I want to discuss the democracy review. I voted against the welfare reform bill because we are an anti-austerity party and that's what Jeremy Corbyn put in the manifestos and that's what we will bring forward to the next general election. And let me tell you something. I will not leave anyone behind. We will do this together. And look, the higher the Tories build their barriers, the taller we will become. So hold your heads up high, stand up straight, get ready to win, prepare for power because we are going to win the next general election in five years time with me as your deputy. Let's do this. <laughs> Richard, what about yourself? I want to start off... <laughs> Fol try fo following that one. <laughs> I, want to, I want to start off by thanking each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart for giving up your spare time in all weathers to fight for a better society. I, like you, am an activist. I didn't stop becoming an activist when I became an MP. I didn't stop becoming an activist when I became a member of the Shadow Cabinet. And I won't stop being an activist uh, if I am your deputy leader. I feel the pain that you did when that exit poll came out at the general election. We cannot allow that ever to happen again. I believe that as members, you are core to our movement. You are the core of our movement. I'll be a campaigning deputy leader. I don't think the role of deputy leader is to be, as I say, a mischief maker in waiting. I don't believe the role of the deputy leader is to be a leader in waiting. I believe the role of deputy leader is to be a campaigner and a servant of all our movement, of all of our broad church. I back our progressive policies. I fully support the previous two manifestos. We can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We can't go back to the future and think that'll make everything okay. I will stand up for party democracy. As I say, we can't have a situation where members are treated as the unpaid posties of the Labour movement. Yes, please deliver leaflets, but if I'm a deputy leader, I'll ensure that you have a greater say in the policies that go on those leaflets. I'll also ensure <laughs> that you will have the opportunity with the unions to fully uh, democratically decide who your parliamentary candidates are at each and every election, and that's why I support open selection. We need to reconnect with our heartlands, and that's why I'll chair a special commission on rebuilding our lost support. Together, as a broad church, we can achieve so much. I'm proud of being from the left. I'm proud of supporting and nominating Jeremy on all occasions. I'm also proud of being uh, secretary of the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, which my hero, Tony Benn, set up. But as Harold Wilson said, a bird needs two wings to fly. The left the overt left is a very important part of that. Let's fly together into governments. Let's put this devastating defeat behind us. Let's learn the lessons and you will succeed for our whole movement and all our communities together. Thank you. Ian, you've got two minutes. Well, thank you, Liam, and thank you, Liverpool. I really shouldn't be here today, not just because of the problems with the trains, but I come from a... A housing estate in Edinburgh, I was left uh, living with my older brother and my mum after my dad passed away at the age of 39 in 1986, at the height of Thatcher's power. But we were brought up to be encased in labour values, to be a proud Scot, and also to support Heart of Midlothian Football Club and not Liverpool. <laughs> I, am statistically, I am statistically more likely to be in jail than in Parliament. The other reason that I shouldn't be here is because I win a seat that the Labour Party shouldn't win. I'm the only red spot in Scotland for a second time after we have been blown away again by this nationalist populist wave. I want to use that marginal seat challenge to go around the country and to organise a Labour Party so that we can win in every part again. And that feeds into three things. It feeds into doing the stuff around the Constitution that is vitally important for this party. Not just for Scotland, but for the, all the nations and all the regions, we have to get power into the hands of the people that matter and out of Westminster. 
And that's why I will take up the challenge of taking personal responsibility for a constitutional convention. I also want to go to all the seats that we won, to all the seats that we lost, and to the seats that we will never win and listen to you. Yes, we're in Liverpool today, but we're just a stone's throw away from five seats that we lost in Wales, Burry North and Burry South. We've had people from Dellen and Hindburn talk today already. We lost in Lee. How did we lose the seats while Liverpool has majorities of 20 and 30,000? That's what we need to do to learn, and as your deputy leader, I will go ahead and make sure we do that. I want to rid this party of any racism and anti-Semitism. I will take personal responsibility for that as well. And we need to unite as a movement. I never, ever want to feel how I felt on the 13th of December again, or how I felt when I was taking good colleagues and helping good colleagues clean out their offices. We need to unite, and let's do one thing. Let's remove all the tags of these ites that we invent as a labour movement. I'm not an ite, I'm simply labour. And I leave you with this. As my political hero John Smith said, all I'm asking for the labour movement to do is to give me the opportunity to serve you. Thank you. And last but very much not least, Rosanna. Thank you. I want unity, but not just unity within the Labour Party. I want unity with the British people. I want their hopes and ambitions to be our hopes and ambitions. I want us truly to become the People's Party by taking forward our proposals of radical change that the country wants. We have to start by showing that we get it. We get the struggles and sacrifices that people make every day from Inverness to Ipswich, from Torquay to Tyneside. My mum is from Poland, my dad is from Pakistan, and I'm proudly British. So modern multiculturalism, I get it. Discrimination and racism, I get it too. My mum worked three jobs. We were cold, we were often hungry, I failed on my A-levels because I was trying to work to supplement the household income. Hard times? I get it. I grew up under Thatcher and Major. Kids like me were written off. But then there was Labour. The Labour Party believed in me and helped me get to university to study to become a doctor aged 24 to serve my community in our NHS. And in government, we lifted 800,000 children out of poverty. The Tories have put them all back in again. I still do shifts in my scrubs in the A&E where I show up for work and I work alongside our frontline NHS workers. Public service, I live it. I'm driven by my Labour values. Our Labour values of social justice, equality, hope, and even by love, love of our party. As a doctor, I start by listening. As your deputy leader, I will listen. And then I will lead and support the leader. And yes, I will offer loyalty. Yes, I will serve our party with the drive, the diligence and hard graft that got me out of poverty and into Parliament. As an emergency doctor, people trust me with the lives of their loved ones. I'm asking you to trust me with our party as your deputy leader. I will fight every day. I will listen to you. I won't let you down. Please give me your vote to serve as your deputy leader. And we will take this fight back to the Tories. I believe in Labour. I believe in you. I believe in us. And I believe we can win. Liverpool, thank you. OK, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone who stayed as well. That's brilliant. Um, we're all off to the Toby Carvery. Can I, have a, a, can I have a round of applause for the people of Liverpool here and everyone else who came? And can I have a round of applause for our candidates? <laughs>